First Fruits of Harvest. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. We are in an amazing time of the year right now with so many commemorations with prophetic events that happened largely at the time of Christ and how that ties to us too and we've been studying this time of Christ's first coming mainly because we've been told to look for him to come the second time and so the more we have an understanding of what happened the first time we'll have a better understanding of the pictures that are used and the instructions that he gives and the events that are going on we have a better picture of when we are told to look for him it's in this context here during this time of Christ's first coming which prophetically started at the triumphal entry but went all the way through the day of ascension over 40 days later so we're in a time right now that's very important because the events that started on Palm Sunday and then even Resurrection Sunday and how that was timed with first fruits. What was started then is still ongoing. And a lot of people will think that, oh, Palm Sunday's over now and Resurrection Sunday's over now. And so it's kind of being pushed out of their mind now and they're just going on with life. But no, we got to keep this in mind. We're in a time frame here of over 40 days this window of time and it's in a time where we are told to watch and there's so many pictures and patterns that are given and we can have so many reminders when we get an idea of what happened during this time Christ wants us to remember him when he came what he did for us in light of that he's coming again and the pictures that took place at this time particularly with the appointed feast days those same pictures are even used for us as Christians and so it's important that we have an understanding of what are the pictures that are being used at this time and that gives us a better idea of what's being talked about and why this time frame even these 40 some days here are so important first corinthians 15:19. if in this life only we have hope in christ we are of all men most miserable but now is christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept for since by man came death by man came also the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. So this is a very important picture and it can get glossed over or we could just do a quick study on it. But when the Bible mentions that we who put our faith and trust in Christ, we are likened to firstfruits at his coming, this begs the question, do we fully understand what that means? Or do we just gloss over it of, well, this is just, you know, first fruit stuff. No, what does that mean? The more that we have an understanding of the context of this picture, the more we'll have an understanding of what the other wording in this whole passage is about too. He's talking about resurrection. Christ has risen from the dead, and that's why he became the first fruits of them that slept. What does the resurrection have to do with first fruits? Well, Christ was buried into the ground just like a seed, and a seed dies when it sprouts and when it buds forth and then produces fruit it comes alive again after that seed died in the ground and that's a picture of christ he was put into the ground but he came back and with that picture he became the first fruits of them that slept he's the first one who could raise himself all the other people who were raised from the dead they had somebody else raise them from the dead but christ is the first fruits because he died and then he rose up by himself and then the picture is that we are going to be like that first fruit picture at his coming and so this is what we're going to explore today in this time of the year during this first fruit and harvest time of the year too right during this time of his first coming let's explore this first fruits picture and this harvest idea picture let's get an idea of what was in the disciples minds when they were talking about this passage that we are going to be first fruits at Christ's coming also we're at a harvest time right now of barley and wheat's going to be starting very soon as well but we're in a period of time that deals with harvests and first fruit but first fruit is not the entire harvest first fruit is only a very small portion of that harvest and this was a very familiar picture to the disciples back then much more agrarian society back then in general most people grew things had gardens of their own or farmers or planters or they definitely knew their neighbors who were they were very well familiar with all these pictures that were being talked about and these likenesses and metaphors. And unfortunately, we are so distantly moved from that whole mentality or even the understanding of how they lived back then for most people. We don't understand the background, their agricultural background that they were coming from. 
that they were viewing these statements from. When you think about the three main appointed feast days, they all deal with first fruits. You have the barley first fruits, and then the wheat first fruits, and then the end of the year first fruits, which take care of all these summer fruits. So this is very important. If the three most important appointed times on the feast day patterns revolve around harvesting and first fruits, we should take a moment and understand what are first fruits, because we'll be missing a large part of the understanding about what these patterns and pictures rehearse if we don't even understand what they're talking about. We've been looking at different harvesting methods and we've learned about the difference of beating barley or wheat and how that was used in the account of Ruth and it's particular to her because she was gleaning and she only had enough to beat. And so we've been learning about some agricultural methods. We've been learning about the tribulum and if you're doing a lot of barley or wheat that's when you'd use that, just do it all collectively. And we've been learning about winnowing and removing the chaff. And you could also deal with that with sifting it and getting some of the larger things out too as well. We've been learning and we've had a very good general idea, an academic idea, of what are first fruits and what was the process that they'd have to go through. But again, first fruits are not the entire harvest, but they do go through a similar process as the harvest. And so these three main appointed times all deal with first fruits and how they are offered unto the Lord. They weren't necessarily offering the whole harvest to the Lord, which they were doing commemoratively, and they were thanking him for it by doing the first fruits. Leviticus 23, 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. Okay, so while they were in the wilderness, even before they got to the promised land, God gave them instructions that once they started farming and planting, they were going to have to bring the first fruits of the harvest to the Lord. It belonged to the Lord. And notice he gives them very specific instructions as well. They're just going to bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest. They weren't going to bring a specific percentage, although that was a tithe separate. But the first fruits was just a sheaf. Now a sheaf is also used interchangeably here in the passage to mean an omer. So he was telling them you need to bring a sheaf that will produce the equivalent amount of an omer's worth of barley or wheat when that first fruit is done as well. So they didn't pick the size of the sheaf necessarily. It had to be an amount that would produce about an omer's worth of that grain. They would bring the sheaf from the field, all bundled up. They'd bring that to the priest, and then the priest would process it separately. So all the farmer had to do was cut out the sheaf and then bring it to the priest on the appointed day for the wave offering. And notice that every farmer had to do this. This wasn't just the priests who had to do this or some special group of people who had to do this symbolically. Every single farmer had to bring a first fruit sheaf. Every farmer had to present the wave offering. And so again, backing up to where we are right now, to have a better understanding of where we are right now prophetically. What are the pictures going on right now? Why are so many pictures from this time of the year used with us and with Christ coming again? And we're even told to be looking for him to come the second time, which was just this period over 40 days, where we are right now. This time of harvest is very important. And again, we in our modern times, we're so disconnected from how they lived back then, and even agriculture in general. Sometimes the most contact we have with agriculture is cutting the grass. But it was completely different back then because most of them were farmers, or they produced something they were very familiar with these cycles, with these pictures, and with what first fruits represented. And it was something that impacted almost every single person back then. And so I wanted to have a better understanding of what are these pictures going on right now. Because the time of Christ's first coming, it was a time that spanned two harvest times. The barley harvest and the wheat harvest. It was a time that mainly dealt with the barley and he was likened to the barley first fruits. That's a picture used with Christ's resurrection. And how we're going to follow that same pattern too. So it's very important we understand what are these pictures that they're using. What are they talking about? 
We have no idea what they're talking about because we don't grow barley ourselves or wheat. We certainly don't process it ourselves. So the more that we can understand what are these pictures, what would the average Israelite do during this time at first fruits? What would be going through their mind? And the more that we can rewalk those same paths, the more it becomes alive to us the importance of the time we are at right now and also these pictures. And also when we look more at this time, particularly the harvest going on right now and Pentecost coming up, this time of harvest time, when we could keep these agricultural pictures in mind, that will change how we view this prophetic time we are at right now. And will help give us patience as we understand that it's spread over 40 days here. But there's important times and processes that are going on in the background during this time of Christ's first coming. So I wanted to learn more about this agricultural background. I wanted to learn more of what are these steps in the first fruits. What would the average person going to Jerusalem and presenting the first fruits, what would be the experience they went through? What would be going through their mind? I wanted to put myself into their shoes so that I could better understand the pictures right now. I needed to understand the background. And I really want to help you wrap your mind around what was it like back then and to help give us a taste and a feel for the importance of first fruits and the pictures that are best understood by actually doing them. And I'm a kinesthetic type of learner. I am very hands-on. I love doing it myself. So I decided that I wanted to have a crash course in agriculture and a crash course in first fruits, and particularly this process. I wanted to reenact this process so I could get a better idea of what are the pictures being used here? What would come to their mind that isn't necessarily spelled out in the scripture? Because this is a picture. It was a picture familiar to the Israelites and to the farmers back then, and were not as familiar with that picture. So I wanted to experience the picture and the importance of this harvest time where we are right now, particularly dealing with first fruits. And so come along. We are having a daytime field trip today. We're going to go out to the field and we're going to harvest first fruits. We'll be talking about barley and wheat. They're both first fruit lessons, are very similar, but barley and wheat look almost identical too as well. So we'll be talking about both interchangeably. And I only have wheat sheaves, but just pretend it's barley because it looks almost the same anyway. But we're going to be talking about this broad concept of first fruits and looking at the barley first fruit particularly. And God instructed the Israelites that when they came into the land and they planted, that one day they would be bringing the first fruits of that harvest to the priests. And they had to collect a sheaf's amount, which would be an omer's amount, which is 2.3 liters of dry measure. So they'd make sure they gathered and cut enough of the barley, or the wheat later on. They'd cut enough to make sure they had enough for the offering when they got to Jerusalem and handed it over to the priests. Now you need a larger sheaf than what I was able to get, but this gives you an idea of if they would cut it, get it all ready, and they would take that sheaf with that omer's equivalent to Jerusalem, and they would take it in the sheaf form. And then in Jerusalem, they would hand it over to the priests as part of their first fruits offering. And again, every farmer had to bring first fruits. So the farmer would hand it off to the priest, and then what would the priest do with it? Leviticus 2.14 And if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruits green ears of corn dried by the fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. And thou shalt put oil upon it, and lay frankincense thereon. It is a meat offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof, and part of the oil thereof, with all of the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And so here are the instructions for the priest of how to take the first fruits and turn it into what's called a meat offering. And so notice the steps here. The corn, the grain, which would cover both barley and wheat at the respective times. That grain, that corn, would be beaten out of full ears. And remember, they only are bringing a sheaf's amount. And so the priest would beat out that corn of that sheaf. They're not using a tribulum for any of this first fruit offering. It's all beaten out. And then once they beat out the grain out of the full ears, which they received from the farmer, then they will roast those over the fire and they'll dry it out that way. And then they'll mix it with some oil and put some frankincense on it. 
and they will burn a portion of that omer amount that was brought to the priest. So the farmer will bring an omer's amount, but the priest will offer up just a portion of it, a memorial of that part, and they will offer that on the fire, and they'll burn that with all the frankincense that went with that particular wave offering. They would burn only the memorial of the barley or the wheat first fruits, and the priest would keep the rest of it. So the first step that the priest would do then would they would have to beat it out. They'd have to beat out the corn out of the ears. So here's a quick video that I took today. Unfortunately, I took it at the wrong resolution and I used up all my wheat. So I only have a low resolution of this. But if you watch closely, you'll see the seeds and the grain falling out of the ears. So the priest would beat it out and they would get the equivalent of an omer's worth for the wave offering. Now, of course, you'd be working with larger amounts, a whole sheaf's amount. So you'd have a lot of stalks and ears left over after you beat out that entire sheaf of it. So you'd use a rake to clean away as much stuff as you can, all the big stuff. And then you're left with the chaff, a lot of the smaller stuff. Now, the sample of wheat that I used in this beating was a modern variety of wheat that is holeless. You could see the holes in the husks. They're all over the place because they fall off very easily in the modern varieties. And this is interesting to note just the differences of it was harder back then because they had a much more limited variety of barley and wheat. They were not the holeless varieties that we have today. But they would still have a lot of chaff just in this initial process after beating the first fruits, whether it's barley or wheat. And so dealing with small amounts, you'd probably just beat it out on a large cloth and then gather it together in the middle. And with your hands, you could pick out the larger stuff, the different stalks and grass of it. And you could then run it through different sifters and sieves and sort out even more twigs and stalks and stuff to where you are boiled down to just the grain and the smallest of chaff. And here again with this modern variety of wheat, you could see there's a lot of chaff generated by the husks that are normally around the grain. And then with the chaff, normally in a breezy place, you can just fork it up into the air or just pour it out with your hand and the wind will blow the chaff away and at least get it far enough from your grain where you could separate the two. And here's an example of just pouring it into a trough. I didn't have a good wind today necessarily, but it was enough to blow it and separate it outside of the trough and keep most of the seed falling inside. So it's just interesting to see how just with a simple wind, a lot of the chaff just fell outside and a lot of the heavier stuff just remained inside. And of course the seeds are heavier so they fall almost straight down, but some of the larger stalks still fell down too. But then you would just use a variety of sieves and sifters and you could get out a lot of that other stuff as well. Especially if you have a good breeze, you'd have very little of that really small stuff. But again, this is a modern wheat that I used in this example and it's just something I found at the floral store. They have different varieties of dried wheat that they use for floral displays, so that's what I used. But I was able to find some barley, and this is unique because this really opens up your eyes to how difficult the agricultural process was, but then also the type of food that they ate. And remember, again, going back to what the farmer had to bring, they had to bring a sheaf, which is an omer's amount of dry barley. They had to bring that much to where the priest could process it and get an omer's amount of barley here at this first fruit time which is again 2.3 liters of barley and barley is interesting because there are holeless varieties today but general and especially back then they only had a hold variety it has a little wrapper on every single piece of grain and they're often called spikelets when they're stored this way and especially if you're going to be storing it for a long time in granaries or whatnot you would store it in spikelet form with these holes still on it and here's a close-up of it where you could see they have all that fiber all around it that little husk right around each one and so what is needed to do is de-hole the barley that's another step if you were going to eat it and here's a close-up difference between barley that's in spikelet form with the husk still on it and on the right barley that's had the husk removed and this is not necessarily an easy process, as I found out. And that's one neat thing about actually doing it and going through these processes is you really get in mind the idea of what was involved in making a meal or making barley bread, which was a very important staple, especially for the poorer people back then. 
barley was very very important and they only had this whole variety so it really gives you insight into the diet that they had back then but then how they lived so it really helps wrap your mind around when we can go through these different processes and learn more about them but there's different ways to dehole them and especially today in our modern time there are machines that do it but back then of course you had to do it manually and one way you can do it it's labor intensive no matter which way you do it but one of the main ways and easiest ways to do it is you just get the grain wet a little bit and just soak it for a little bit to where the husks get wet and then you start pounding it in a large mortar and pestle usually something very big and that just makes the wet skins slide right off as you pound it because the grains are still hard enough and it just peels off like the dry skin on an onion sometimes and as you pound it you can see the skins are coming off And in a large batch, you just have an extra large wooden mortar and pestle, and you just get it wet and then pound the whole thing. And then you could rinse it in water and remove the husks, and then you just lay out the barley in the sun for a few hours to dry it out. And then you can grind it and go on to the next step. And so the barley that the farmer was bringing, or the wheat, all of it would be hulled or have some type of husk on it. But again, they're bringing a sheaf's amount of an omer's equivalent of the barley. They would bring the sheaf, the priest would process it, beat it, the priest would then have to winnow it, remove the chaff, and then prepare the meat offering, the form of it, that God instructed them at. So there's all these steps that the Israelite farmer would observe when they went to the temple. And we're not familiar with these because we're not normally standing there in the temple while they did it. And obviously they don't have the temple anymore. But this is what the average farmer observed every single year at the appointed times. How the priests handled the first fruits, these steps that they went through. So after they beat out the omer of barley, then, like the instructions say, they would roast the corn of it. And they had a large copper brazier at that time that they would parch the barley in, much larger than the one that I have. But this is parched barley that's been parched in the hull. And then they'd have to grind it down in the meal. And there's different type of grinders. The one in the Middle East there is called a kern. And very similar to the Mexican metate that I have here. Very, very similar. So there's not much difference. They all work the same way. And so I tried both ways. And really there's almost no difference of if you grind the parched barley with the holes on or if you don't. But if you grind it with the holes on, you obviously have a dirtier flour you have a lot more fiber in it a lot more fiber and doing some research on the barley first fruits offering when it was offered as a meat offering i was wanting to find out did they de-hole the barley or not and it appears that they did not they just roasted the barley whole and then ground it without processing the holes at all and it just makes for a coarse flour but then you would just run it through sieves and that would make the fine flour and then they would mix it with the other ingredients and this is also what I noticed with the reenactments that the Temple Institute did with other groups there in Israel this year and even last year. When they harvested the barley, they sifted it out and winnowed it and got all the chaff out. But then they were left with the hulled barley, the spikelets, and that's what they roasted in their reenactment. And so they didn't bother to dehull it, they just roasted it right away. And then they sent the roasted hulled spikelets through the grinder. So this seems to match up with what I've read so far and seems to be the understanding that they just ground it with the holes still on it. And in the reenactments that they did, here are different volunteers that they used who would sift down that coarse flour, run it through different sifters and sieves of different degrees, and that would eventually get them down to a fine flour that they would use in their offering. Leviticus 2.1 And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons the priests. And he shall take thereout his handful of the flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar, to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savour unto the Lord. And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. 
and so this is a general instruction that was given to the priest and only a portion of that will be actually burned as a memorial on the altar and the remainder of the offering will be for the priest but note in a general form it is going to be fine flour but this is what the ground barley first roots would look like but if you did the whole at first and you would end up with a finer flour more akin to what we're used to it'd be more of a white flour but it'd be barley and again keep in mind the priests are the one who are processing it here so it's very busy there in the temple courtyards at the first fruit offering it's not just a single offering going on ceremonially no it's every farmer in israel showing up and offering their first fruits offering and grinding is quite a bit of work but if you are used to it it's not as bad but still that would be a lot of work on that day all of a sudden associated with first fruits and grinding the dehold barley definitely makes for a much cleaner flour and just doing a quick comparison just to give you an idea of it and the picture really doesn't do it justice either but on the left you see a wheat flour that's store-bought and all-purpose that's what we're familiar with and that's ground really fine and in the middle you see the barley flour that was ground on the matate which is very similar to the grinding method that they had then too but that was unsifted there in the middle but they could sift it through cheesecloth and they had a variety of different sifters to where they could get it down to a fine flour and so then on the right you see a sifted variety and it's very close to our store-bought variety and the metate grinder that i have it's not been properly seasoned it could actually be smoother and give a smoother grind to it but i haven't taken the time to do that so the flour that they had back then was very close to what we had today and even depending on what you're grinding you can actually get it smoother than some varieties that you buy in the store but this just gives you an idea of this is what the priests were doing on first fruits offering day and then once they ground down that barley or that wheat for that particular respective first fruits they would then have the flour of it and then they would mix in the oil and then put frankincense on top of it and these were the instructions after they went through all that processing before and then they would wave it before the lord they would typically wave it left to right and then down and up and that was a presentation of that first fruit offering from the farmer after we went through all those processes and now they were offering that first fruits to the lord and then the priest would take a portion of that a memorial typically a handful of that and they would put that onto the altar with all of the frankincense that went with that offering and that was a wave offering the wave offering done for every single farmer who brought a sheaf of their first fruits multiple steps involved but every single farmer had to bring one and here's the temple institute rendition where they show the priest beating out the barley and processing it getting out the chaff winnowing it and then they would roast it and then grind it and then that's what they would then mix with the olive oil and the frankincense and put that in the wave offering on the farmer's end so to speak there wasn't that much involved he had to bring a sheaf's worth of first fruits to jerusalem and then he would hand it off to the priest and then he would basically watch them do it beat it thresh it winnow it roast it grind it mix it and then offer it so a lot more processes on the priest's end that took place at the temple during first fruits but the farmer would see the first fruits offering presented to the lord and that's the whole picture of it every farmer would present the first of their harvest to the lord it belonged to him this wasn't a voluntary offering it belonged to the lord and so now that we have an idea of what happened on first fruits day and a better idea of what went on during the harvest time let's take a look at the overlapping harvests and the overlapping first fruits that happened in this window that also happened to be when christ came the first time and this period of over 40 days where we are right now what pictures what processes are going on in the background that the disciples the apostles and the average israelite fully understood and did not think twice about we've been learning about the barley harvest because that's the one that matures first that's really the first fruits of first fruits it's the first thing harvested every year and we learned that ruth arrived at the start of the barley harvest 
And so she's tied toward this important time when all the farmers are getting ready to take their sheaf to Jerusalem. And remember, where was Bethlehem? Just up the road from Jerusalem. So keep all these agricultural pictures in mind with Ruth arriving at Bethlehem at the start of barley harvest. Because remember, first fruits wave offering was right at this time as well, and is right at the start of the barley harvest. And God instructed them that the count that would count down to Shavuot, Pentecost, that began at this time when the sickle is put to the corn. So the exact same time that the barley harvest is starting, the exact same time that the farmers are gathering their sheaf to take to Jerusalem for the first fruits offering, that's when Ruth arrived in Bethlehem. And like we learned about, they would bundle them into sheaves and then they just stack them against each other so that they could dry out, so the grain could dry out, so the stalks could dry out. It just makes it a whole lot easier when you process it later if it's dry. It just helps the corn to fall out of the stalk and out of the ear a whole lot easier. And it also gets it ready for storage. You don't want any moisture in it at all when you put it into storage. And so keep in mind, they've offered up the first fruits. And now Ruth is starting to glean after the barley harvest has started. They're stacking up all these sheaves everywhere. She's going around picking and gleaning. She beat it out every day in the even and shared it with Naomi. And so you see two processing timelines. You see barley being sheaved together and gathered together for a later processing, for a later threshing. But you see the picture of Ruth who's having an ongoing processing and threshing by beating it. Almost an identical process to how the priests process the first fruit offering. They also beat the sheaves just like Ruth. And she did that for the remainder of the barley harvest. And so they were still gathering barley for quite a while after she started. And apparently in that story particularly, they just saved it up for processing that they were going to do at the end of the wheat harvest. They're just apparently going to do all the processing all at one time. And then there is the wheat harvest. And apparently Boaz had crops of both barley and wheat. And wheat is ready about a month or more later after barley is ready for harvest. So she's been gleaning for a month now of barley. And she's been processing it for a month. And now the workers are switching to harvesting the wheat harvest. And again, they do the same thing because they have to dry it out as well. Gathering it in sheaves and drying it out and getting it ready for eventual processing. And the story talks about how... It was at the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest that Boaz was at the threshing floor winnowing barley. Even though barley had been harvested before, over a month before, they were now getting to where it was nice and dry, and they finally got everything ready together in one place. They were just going to process it all at the same time, which happened to work out to where apparently it was seven weeks after the first fruit wave offering seven weeks after Ruth arrived in Bethlehem. So for seven weeks, she's been gleaning, she's been beating, she's been threshing, she's been winnowing, she's been grinding. She's been staying very busy all during this time, using a different processing method than what Boaz is about to use. And then around the time of Shavuot, and appears like the day or right after Shavuot, when everybody's on the threshing floor, and apparently they just had a large feast celebrating the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and basically celebrating the conclusion of the wheat harvest. That's what it appears to be. That time is when Ruth went and talked with Boaz. That time was the wheat first fruits, which was called Shavuot, which we also know as the time of Pentecost. Now, barley first fruits, that was just a meat offering. They just roasted it and ground it up and presented that to the Lord as an offering that way. Whereas the wheat first fruits, that is made into two loaves. So again, it goes through those same grinding processes and the threshing and winnowing and all that. They'd still have to do that again. And that was done with the wheat at the wheat first fruits for that wave offering. And they would just wave the loaves of bread. Whereas in the barley, they waved the bowl of the meal. And so again, look at this big picture here. The harvests that are going on right now between two important times. The barley first fruits, the wave offering of the Omer, and wheat first fruits, Pentecost, Shavuot, were in this prophetic window right now. These are going on in the background. 
This is the buzz that the average Israel farmer would be doing in their daily life. But then this is how it intersected with the appointed feast days, which were first fruits of what they were doing in their life. And so again, that reminds us of where we are right now. We've been looking at Christ's first time. The pinnacle of his ministry, which started at the triumphal entry, which fulfilled prophecy to the day of Daniel's prophecy, and then extended for just over 40 days till the day of ascension. And he fulfilled the first fruits picture in that window, this window where we are still right now. And so this is what we need to keep in mind and remember as we go forward. Just because the main events that we're most often familiar with are technically done, we're still in this time this time of harvest, this time of first fruits, which prophetically is linked to Christ's coming because he was the first fruits and then he went through the process of becoming the first fruits. These are connected and then we are told that we will afterwards be in a similar pattern of first fruits at his coming. The first time he came, he fulfilled first fruits at his first coming. And we're told we're going to be first fruits following his example at his second coming. So think about that right now. The redemption story and pictures are in this entire time of Christ's first time here. We're in a first fruits time right now when we are told to be looking for him to come the second time. And that we will follow his pattern when he comes. We're in this time right now when he came the first time. We're in this time where he fulfilled this. And so our expectation of redemption is still in this time when Christ came the first time. And we have so many ways we can remember what he did, the picture of us, and remember in light of his coming. Remember when he came at the Lord's Supper is when he gave the ordinance of the Last Supper to help his disciples and us remember him till he comes again. He wants us to remember the first time he came, what he did when he came the first time. He gives us remembrances and memorials and tokens to help us remember this time where we are right now. And the more we consider and keep in mind the agricultural pictures that are going on in the background that they were familiar with, and we consider the timing of what happened in these events in Christ's first time, it gives us an idea of some things he's alluding to. He told his disciples to remember him till he comes at the Last Supper, which was only a few hours before first fruits. And when he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that was only a few hours also before first fruits. And it was also during the time when he told his disciples repeatedly, Be ye ready when I come the second time. Verse 23 But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. The dead in Christ will rise, they will follow the first fruits pattern because Christ rose, because he became the first fruits. And we will also rise because of him because of what he did at his coming. The whole idea of first fruits, understanding first fruits, is tied and linked to understanding his coming. And we are expecting him to come the second time. And while the temple does not exist today, and obviously majority of us aren't farmers and we don't grow barley or wheat, there is still the spirit of first fruits. Several years ago I did quite a bit of gardening. I haven't been able to do any lately just because I've been so busy with ministry work but I have always enjoyed gardening and growing things I don't like the weeding part but I do enjoy growing it and getting the first fruits out of the garden when you put all that work into it you like to get that first green squash or that first green pepper or that first tomato and if you've ever gardened you know that expectation when you put all that work into a garden when you work in the soil when you work in getting out all the rocks and their weeds and you plant everything and you keep watering it and you keep watering it and you water it keep all the bugs away and you put a lot of work into it and you have this expectation of fruit growing and coming forth and you see it growing and you are counting down the days so to speak of any day now i'll have that first tomato or that first green squash or whatever you look forward to that first fruit but here's something to think about we look forward to that first fruit today because we want to consume it. It's for us. We want that first tomato so we can have our first tomato sandwich of the year. But what is the picture of first fruits? What is the whole concept and spirit behind first fruits? First fruits belong to God. 
That is the picture. That is the shadow. That is a reminder that the Israelite farmers were told and reminded of every single year. The first fruits don't belong to you. They belong to God. And this is the picture we need to consider with ourselves too as well. Who are the first fruits? Those that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We are His, which means one day He is going to collect what is His. It belongs to Him. We are not our own, and we need to live like we are first fruits. As though we do belong to the Lord, because we do, and as though one day, at His coming, He is going to collect His first fruits. He's going to pick up His purchased possession. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We are redeemed, we are purchased, and because we understand what was done for us, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we should live like first fruits. We should be zealous of good works. We should be following the same pattern of first fruits, bringing forth fruit in our life. That's what our good works are, it has nothing to do with our salvation. But it is the fruit that's grown in our life because He has redeemed us. We love Him with our life, with our service, with our all. We love Him because He first loved us. How we live in service for Him shows how much we love Him. One day He is coming back, and that is our blessed hope, that is our glorious appearing. We are looking for Him to come this second time to pick up His first fruits, His purchased possession. And it was at this time, after He rode into Jerusalem, His disciples were asking Him when He would be coming. And He told them during the days of Noah and Lot, and all that that we've covered before, and He told His disciples, Be ye ready. Be watching for me, be looking for me, be remembering me till I come again. Be ye ready. As we look for Christ, that should affect how we live when we understand what we are and why he's coming back. He's coming back to pick up his first fruits, and he wants us to be ready. Trimming our lamps, rising up, casting off the works of darkness, threshing ourselves, winnowing ourselves. We are the first fruits, but we are also the priests. We are kings and priests. We need to do the beating. We need to do the threshing. We need to do the winnowing. We need to cast off the works of darkness, get it out of the warp and woof of our life, so that we can shine bright for Christ. So we can be the offering and the first fruits acceptable in His sight, that's ready for Him when He returns. We are looking for him to come the second time, understanding what happened the first time, who he's coming back for, the picture, and what we should be doing as we look for him. And he told us he was coming again. He told us to remember him till he comes. And we have heard the trumpet call that the bridegroom cometh, our Redeemer cometh. So we are looking up, we are lifting up our heads, because we know our redemption draweth nigh. So we will love him and we will serve him, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, first and highest above all else. Maranatha. <laughs>